What a wonderful, wonderful group. It's so amazing just to be together in this way, start off the day like this. Good morning. Today is Thursday, February 18th, 2021. Jewish law has a very sophisticated understanding of property, sophisticated and nuanced. For example, possession and ownership are not the same and they are dealt with differently in Jewish law. Let me just give you one example out of many possible examples, but one example is in the, the Gemara, the Talmud, the tractate Baba Metziah, which deals with civil law. The second chapter, famously known, Elu Metzios, deals with the mitzvah of returning a lost object. If you find an object that obviously someone has lost, there's a mitzvah in the Torah, to try your best to return it to its owner. <clears throat> if it is not possible to return it, then a person who finds it can keep it. But there are two requirements that must be met in order for a person who finds an object that was lost to be able to keep it for themselves. The first is that it is impossible to definitively return it to its rightful owner. For example, the object has no identifying mark. For example, a coin or a piece of fruit or some other object that is generic. So there's no way that the real owner could come and say, yes, I can identify that object because it has my name on it or it looks like this or it's something there's something unique about it that's called the siman an identifying mark if there's no siman then it's not possible to return it to its owner because you can never be sure that this is the correct owner because there's no way for the owner to identify it that's number 1 <clears throat> but a second requirement is that the actual owner must have realized that he or she lost the object and must have given up hope of ever getting it back. That's called yush, abandoning hope of ever getting it back. If I lost an object, I don't know where it is. It's not in my own domain and there is no identifying mark on it. So I realize I'm never going to be able to get it back because even if somebody did find it, I will not be able to provide the information that identifies me as the, as the owner because there's no identifying mark on it. So if I am a finder and I find an object, even if it's an object that I know I will not be able to return because there's no identifying mark, I'm still not allowed to keep it because it has an owner even if I can't find who it is until we can assume that the owner realized that he lost it and actively abandons any hope of getting it back. So ownership is different than possession. That's in the second chapter. <clears throat> the first chapter of Baba Metzia has a different case. And it's a very famous case. This is the way the tractate, the volume begins. Shnayim Ogzim Metalis. Two people are holding on to a talus. It could be a talus. It could be a scarf. It could be a Volvo. It just means an object. What's the case? There's an object. It does not have an identifying mark. We presume that the owner has already abandoned hope of getting it back, so it is ownerless. So if an object is truly ownerless and cannot be returned to its original owner, then the rule is, as we mentioned, whoever takes possession of it owns it. The problem in this case is, at the very same moment, Shnayim Oaks and Metalis, two people took hold of different ends of this object. So they both have possession at the same moment. One says, I'm the one that found it and it belongs to me. 
וזה אמר, אני מצסיע. And the other one says, no, I found it and it belongs to me. Sounds like it's a story from Dr. Seuss. זה אמר כולה שלי. This one says the entire object belongs to me. וזה אמר כולה שלי. And the other one says, no, this entire object belongs to me. Rashi explains that we're talking about an object that both of them are literally holding on to because if there was no ownership and one has possession and the other claims to extract it from the possession of the other, the one who has possession is assumed to be the owner. The one who wants to extract it from the other's possession must bring definitive proof that it belongs to them. But in this case, there is no proof. So Rashi explains the case we're talking about is they both possess it. They both have an equal claim and there is no original owner. It's an ownerless object. <coughs> There's a very great rabbi, a wonderful, wonderful person, a rabbi's rabbi, a well-known speaker, very influential person. His name is Rabbi Benjamin Blech. Perhaps you've heard of him. Perhaps you've read some of his writings, which I urge you to do. He always has wisdom to share. Perhaps you've seen some of his videos. I urge you to do so because he is an eloquent speaker, Rabbi Benjamin Blech, a rabbi's rabbi. A few years ago, he and his wife celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. Mazel tov, they should live and be well till 120. <clears throat> and on that occasion, he told the following story. He said, many people ask me, what's the secret? of our happy marriage. And he tells them, I learned the secret the first time I ever studied Talmud, when I began to study Gemara as a little boy. And the first passage that we studied, which by the way is traditional in many day schools and yeshivos, the first passage that is studied of the Talmud by little boys is Baba Metzia, this tractate. And the first page is the case that I just shared with you. Shnaim Oksim Atalas. Two people are holding on to Atalas. Ze'amar Anim One says, I found it. The other says, I found it. One says, it belongs to me. The other says, it belongs to me. The Talmud has a very, very long discussion of what should happen. It seems like a, a conundrum. How do you figure this out? The Mishnah says, one of the, the first opinion that is given is, Yach Loku. They divide it. They divide it. <laughs> In other words, nobody gets everything that they want, but everyone gets part of what they want. Now, that is a rule of law, civil law, for courts to apply in a given specific case. But Rabbi Blech says, that first passage of Talmud that I ever studied when I was a boy, I never forgot that. And it made a deep impression on me. Because it's a really important lesson in life. No one gets everything they want. Not everything is yours. You are not the center of the world. You have to learn how to compromise. You have to learn how to be sensitive to someone else who has a different opinion, who wants something different. And then he wrote, after 60 years of a happy marriage, my recommendation is not to say this is mine, but rather to say, it is ours. It will not cause you to give up one half, but miraculously, it will help both of you to gain much, much more. 
this is an insight. It's easy to learn when you're learning the Talmud and it's abstract. It's much harder to implement in real life. But so many times we're in a situation, especially in marriage, but other contexts also. I say this is mine. You say it's yours. I say it belongs to me. You say it belongs to you. Yach loku. Find a way to compromise. Find a way to share it. That's the secret to a happy marriage. The secret to a happy life. My friends, I want to wish you well. Have a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing all of you soon in person.